Hi, everyone, and welcome to Self-Care Through Food, Preventing Iron and Vitamin B12 Deficiencies. I'm Michelle McDonald Wurstak, a dietitian and diabetes educator um, and a nutrition coordinator at the Hamilton Family Health Team, and I'm here with my colleague, Hillary. Hi. Thanks. Yes, I'm Hillary Millward. I'm one of the dietitians with the Hamilton Family Health Team as well. And um, just a couple of things before we get started. If anybody has any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat box. Um, and today we are talking about two very, very common deficiencies, iron and vitamin B12. So we're going to get right into it. So um, why they are, these are some of the things we're going to cover. We're going to talk a little bit about why they're important. You know, are you getting enough based on the recommended daily amounts? Who is at risk of deficiency? And there's quite a few populations here that, that are at high risk of deficiency. We were just talking about this beforehand. Um, and, you know, some of the food sources and whether or not you should consider supplementing. And of course, you know, your dietitians are always here if you have, you know, any questions that you have. So, um, two of the biggest um, conditions and, and side effects of having iron deficiency are fatigue. So, fatigue is such a big part of both iron deficiency and vitamin B12 deficiency. And a lot of it also has to do with cognitive function, so this inability to concentrate. Sometimes we can also feel symptoms of numbness and tingling in the hands and feet. So we're going to talk more specifically um, about each one uh, separately. So um, as I said, you know, with iron deficiency in particular, fatigue and weakness are really, really common. So fatigue is really hard to pinpoint. Um, and this is one of the first lines of defense that we look at as dietitians about, you know, where your fatigue might be coming from. Poor circulation is also really common. So you, um, those with iron deficiency might feel that they have cold hands and cold feet all the time. You might also experience hair loss, um, skin changes, and brittle nails. Um, and sometimes when iron deficiency is really bad, you might get um, what we call like spoon-shaped nails where there's some, um, you know, interesting things going on with the nails. Headaches are also very common, but can also be affected by many other issues. And another one is changes in appetite. So you might have some food aversions or unusual cravings. And sometimes this can even show up as cravings for non-food items if iron deficiency is severe enough. Um, and if you're you know, finding that that's the case, it's, if you have any of these symptoms, it's a good idea to run it by your dietitian or your, or your family physician. So why is this so common? This is something that we see really, really often. Both Michelle and I had patients today, multiple patients today that um, had uh, these issues. So um, one of the uh, main reasons is that we have a low intake of iron. And we're gonna talk a little bit about food sources today as well. Um, and this is in particular in uh, you know, infants and young children, especially if there's picky eating or low appetite. Um, this is also common in teens and in pregnant women and perimenopausal or premenopausal women. And uh, that's in particular because our needs are a little bit higher, um, especially for women. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that as well. And um, vegetarian and vegan diets, even though they are, you know, really expanding in terms of popularity these days, it's something we really need to make sure that we're getting appropriate levels of vegetarian sources of iron. And sometimes even just avoiding grains can also be a big part of it too, especially with fortification that we see. Other reasons that we um, see iron deficiency are that there are things that block absorption. So phytates, coffee, and tea are um, a couple of those things and phytates are essentially found in our plant-based foods and they bind up you know minerals and, and things like that so it's very common in a lot of our high fiber foods that we might uh, experience some phytates and so we're going to talk a little bit about that as well and one of the big reasons as well is because of increased loss of iron so this is in particular important um, with menstrual loss so anybody who's you know having a, a menstrual cycle and losing iron every month um, this is a big problem for a lot of people especially when they're heavy um, we also might see loss in the gut and, you know, those who are frequent blood donors. So these are all really, really common for people. So, you know, there's a lot that we can talk about and a lot of science behind this. But the way that I like to think about it is that your iron is, you know, basically found in your red blood cells. So you have your red blood cell and then within your red blood cell, you have hemoglobin. And then right at the center of your hemoglobin, you have your iron and if you don't have enough iron, you might not be able to make enough hemoglobin. And this can shrink your red blood cells, makes them too skinny. So when this happens, it makes it 
very difficult for your body to carry oxygen around your body, right? So that's the main role that iron and, you know, our red blood cells and our hemoglobin have in the body is that it's actually carrying that oxygen around. So um, this is very, very important. And it's especially important in the young ones. So during pregnancy and um, infants is really, really critical for neurological development and normal growth. Um, so one thing that we always are concerned about, if you have a young one at home who's got a really low appetite, they're not good eaters, they might be really picky, we would really encourage you to touch base with your doctor, your dietitian, because there could be actually underlying deficiencies. And if you correct that, oftentimes appetite goes way up. So very, very important for the body. So it is one of the most common nutritional deficiencies in the world. Um, like I said, Michelle and I see this really, really often. Um, and so it can range from just a mild deficiency um, to actual anemia. So anemia is when your hemoglobin actually goes down too low out of the normal range, right? So you, um, the, one of the ways that we measure iron deficiency is through uh, looking at something in the blood called ferritin. And so this is usually one of the main things that your doctors are going to check when they do blood work. And this is the storage form of your iron. So how much stores, how much extra iron do you have? Because we need to make red blood cells all the time. We need to make sure we have good stores. So we might have just low stores, that would be a mild deficiency, or we would have very low stores and our hemoglobin is low. And that's true anemia. So how do we prevent this? Really the best way to prevent is to make sure that we're getting enough for our age group. And you can see it bounces around a lot if you look into this chart. So the young ones, like I say, you know, from seven to 12 months, this is where our iron, you know, stores, are, our, our iron needs are really, really high because we're making lots of blood, you know, as, as babies, we need, to, we need to make more. So, um, and you'll also see that uh, for females, it's actually a little bit higher. And this is um, really because of the menstruation cycle. So you can see once we, you know, hit menopause for women, it just drops right back down. So um, because we're having losses every month, we need to make sure that we're taking in more iron in in this way and also pregnancy as well. So we're going to talk a little bit about food sources and also one thing I want to say I do see that there's some questions here and we will try and get to them um, maybe near the end so uh, hold on to your questions. Uh, you can still you know type them in of course as you think of them we just might get them to later. So um, there are two types of iron. Um, so one is your heme iron and the other is your non-heme iron. These are your food sources, right? So everybody needs to make sure that they're getting food sources of iron. So the main difference between these is that heme iron is from our animal sources, non-heme iron is from our plant sources, okay? And one of the main things that we find is that heme iron is typically better absorbed. It's typically easier for the body to assimilate and get from our food. And the plant sources, because they're often wrapped up in fiber and phytates and all of these things, um, but they tend to, we tend to need higher amounts of that um, vegetarian source of iron. So, um, you know, it makes it extra important for those who are vegetarian and uh, vegan uh, with those types of diets that we need to make sure that you're getting really high sources and enough of that um, vegetarian source of iron, just because it's a little bit more difficult to absorb. Okay, so we're going to review a couple of the food sources there. So um, this is your heme iron, right? So you can see just by the list that these are your animal sources of iron. So you can see, you know, I'm sorry to those who don't like liver, and there's a lot of liver haters out there. <laughs> liver is one of the highest sources. Um, we don't necessarily recommend you eat large amounts of liver because there are other issues that you can run into if you get too much liver. Um, and, you know, so it, it's not to say that you should be eating tons of those things, but, you know, things like oysters and mussels and beef and some of our uh, seafood like clams and shrimp are actually really nice sources and much higher than our, our beloved chicken that most of us eat, you know, most commonly. Um, the next is going to be our non-heme iron sources. So this is, there's a larger list. Um, this is just the highest sources. So you can see infant cereal is quite high. That's those pablums and things like that. But, you know, a lot of these, um, a lot of these sources are, are fortified. So some of the most naturally high occurring sources of iron, I always like to think of our lentils, 
pumpkin seeds, kidney beans, and spinach. Those are some of my favorites that I like to, you know, say, especially for those vegetarian eaters out there. Those are some that you can really work on getting frequently. Um, and I find pumpkin seeds are, I always have some next to my desk. They're a nice, easy snack and have some other benefits as well. So um, definitely worth increasing some of these food sources. Okay. So the other thing that we can do, um, like I said before, because some of our iron is not always well absorbed, one of the best things we can do is increase our sources of vitamin C rich foods. So vitamin C really helps to increase our body's natural ability to absorb the iron. So easy ways that you can do this are by thinking about adding a fruit or vegetable to each meal to help to enhance your iron absorption. Um, and so the recommended uh, intakes for vitamin C are 75 to 90 milligrams. And you can see even just something like a bell pepper or some strawberries or some oranges can get you at that you know, recommended amount or even more. So really by making sure that we're adding a wide variety of fruits and vegetables to each meal um, can actually make it much better for our bodies to absorb that iron. Now, you might be wondering, for those who have true iron deficiency or iron deficiency anemia, you may need to consider supplementation. Now, these supplements that we state here do um, anything over you know 27 milligrams of iron requires a, a doctor's prescription so if you do have anemia it's important that you speak with your doctor about the appropriate dose and the appropriate type of supplement because everybody is really different now um, is there's lots of different kinds out there and when we make recommendations about amount of iron one thing that's important to look at is the amount of elemental iron. So this will be kind of on the side of that bottle, the one we all need to put our readers on to actually see. Um, so it's important to look at the amount of elemental iron and this will tell you actually how much iron is in there. Sometimes on the front of the bottle, it's not always um, the same. So like I say, there's many different kinds and it's something that, you know, if you're uncertain, please talk to your doctor, your nurse practitioner, your dietitian, because we can definitely give you more specific recommendations about which one is best for you and why. So um, iron supplements, some people are really weary of them because they can cause some symptoms, but for most people, there are no symptoms, especially if you have adequate fiber intake already, right? So sometimes, you know, if, you are, if, you're, if your diet is already a little bit low in fiber, you can be more at risk of experiencing things like constipation. Black stools are also really normal just because of the, the type of uh, supplement that you might get. And other people just feel a little bit, you know, unwell while they're taking them. But this is not the, 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 the common standard. Most people feel okay if they're on the right supplement. So oftentimes if you don't feel okay, it could be a sign that you need to talk to your doctor or dietitian about optimizing and making sure that you're on the appropriate dose and the appropriate type of supplement. And they can be expensive too, depending, but you know, uh, Michelle and I were just talking about this um, before the webinar and some of them are actually quite cheap. So um, just a couple of things to keep in mind. Okay, so I'm going to pass it over to Michelle. She's going to talk a little bit about B12 deficiency. Thanks, Hillary. So we're going to get into another common deficiency. This is vitamin B12, and it's very common, actually. They estimate about a third of adults over the age of 50 are low in B12. And there's many risk factors, and many are similar to what Hillary was mentioning for risk factors for low iron. Vegetarian eating, because the B12 sources aren't there, um, the intake may not be um, adequate to meet the needs. Medications, lots of interactions with common medications. We've listed just a couple here, your PPIs for acidity, metformin that's used in diabetes. These all affect your B12 status. Aging, aging also seems to be um, part of the changes that happen with the gut in terms of acid production, as, as well as things like that little intrinsic factor, that little tiny protein in your stomach that's needed to help absorb B12. So issues like heartburn or other GI conditions, we always think about B12 as dietitians because we know any GI condition can definitely have an impact on B12 absorption. And then of course, any type of surgery for the gut, bariatric surgery, hernia, et cetera, where you would wanna to assess to see if that person is in fact getting adequate B12. 
So how do I know if I'm low in B12? Well, there's symptoms. You can always go by the symptoms. And a lot of the symptoms are rather vague sometimes, that low energy, the fatigue, sometimes difficulty concentrating. As symptoms or as the level gets lower and lower, so the B12 levels ideally should be with the newer ranges, somewhere between 250 to 600. Once people start to go less than 220, they're now becoming insufficient. Once they go down less than about 139, 140, depending on your lab, is actually true deficiency. So as deficiency levels worsen, you may notice more neurological changes, things like the numbness and tingling in toes and feet. You may notice effects on mood, depression, a little bit of memory loss, dementia. So so these are symptoms that can happen for many reasons, but B12 is always something to consider if people are presenting with these symptoms. Because it has a very important role in red blood cell production, and Hillary already mentioned this with iron being an essential um, uh, chemical needed to make the red blood cells. Uh, B12 is also very important for making um, part of the blood, red blood cells as well as things like DNA synthesis of many other cells. It also is, even has an immune function benefit. So neutrophils are some of the white blood cells we produce when we're sort of mounting an immune response to an, ant, uh, an antigen that's invading the body. So B12 is actually very important for our immunity. And, and during COVID, you know, that's something that is front and center in our minds in terms of ways to how do we maintain a good immune function. So how much B12 do I need? The dose is actually pretty tiny. It's 2.4 micrograms a day, which people find very surprising because when you start to look at supplements, they can be much, much higher than that. So when in fact you start to look at food sources, you can see that B12 comes from our animal sources. So foods like milk, yogurt, and cheese, your meat, your chicken, fish, and um, those type of animal products will give you a B12 source. And once again, you can see liver on the list, but as Hillary mentioned, we're not... We're not recommending liver often because of too much vitamin A, but things like clams and some of the seafood is very rich in B12. They may not be that popular either, but you know, depending on the person, that may be a, a very good food source. So you can see this list of food sources. If you're looking for more on this, you can always go to um, the Dietitians of Canada. They also have a great food list on B12 sources. So how can I get vitamin B12 if I'm following a vegetarian or a vegan style of eating? So there's different types of vegetarian eating, and it's a very healthy style of eating for our heart health and other health conditions. And depending on the type of vegetarian will determine if you're getting dietary sources. So if you are a lacto-ovo-vegetarian, meaning you consume dairy products and egg, you will get sources of B12 from that dairy products and eggs. Versus if you're a vegan, you may be at greater risk of B12 deficiency because the food sources are much more limited because you're not consuming animal products. And in that case, you would have to rely on fortify nutritional yeast as a source of B12 or supplementation with, with a vitamin B12 supplement. And it's really important to, to think about this um, as uh, women are having children because I did actually have a couple cases where I had young children that were B12 deficient that were born to vegan mothers. And again, just trying to figure out how much B12 is needed, what food options are available when you're following a vegan style can be challenging. So an, another reason to connect with your dietitian so that we can help you problem solve a little bit and ensure that moms and babes are getting adequate amounts of B12. So if you do find you have a low B12, you get a B12 test from your doctor, it comes back low, that's when we need to treat you. And the treatment is B12 rich foods plus a supplement of B12 for three months. And then we retest you again to see how you respond. Some people are what we call super responders. You give them a thousand micrograms of B12 and they go from 150 to 550, which is great. Other people do not respond that well. They may, you may supplement them and they may go from 150 to you know, 201. That may be a person who may have to take B12 for an extended period of time and perhaps lifelong. So everyone is different. So that's why it's really important to connect with your doctor or dietitian to have this discussion. Good news though, many people say to me, well, I used to get B12 shots. Yes, B12 shots do work, but we did find by the third or fourth week, when you're due for your next shot, many people were really noticing fatigue by then. And in fact, newer research is showing that taking an oral B12, 1,000 micrograms a day, is just as effective as injections once a month. 
and in fact maintains a much more normal balance B12 throughout the month. And it's much, much cheaper. Plus it saves you time. You don't have to come into the office every month for an injection. So we've talked about a lot. We've covered it in a whirlwind, iron and B12. So we hope you enjoyed our short time together um, and hope that you've walked away with a better understanding of why B12 and iron are important for our health and to have a handle on which foods can give us those nutrients as well as what to do if you think you might be low. Um, so part of these sessions that we're doing, these webinars that people are asking for different topics, part of it is to give you ideas, some evidence-based information so that you can make uh, a change in your perhaps your eating pattern or um, perhaps going to the doctor or the dietitian to get further assessment. So here's some examples of some goals. You know, you might decide, well, Hillary said that coffee can block some of the iron, so I'm going to make sure I don't take my iron pill with a mouthful of coffee every morning, right? That could be a goal that you set. For B12, you may find that, you know, oh, you know, I didn't realize that dairy has B12. I'm going to make an effort to have that every day to have more of a source of B12 in my diet. So again, all of this information, we're hoping that you can take away one or two things that you could actually do this week that would improve your nutritional health. So this is just a summary of some of the key nutrients for optimal physical and mental health. And today we talked about two, um, B12 and iron, and we've also done another session on magnesium. And so we're, we're going through the different nutrients one or two at a time to give you some of that information that people have been asking for. So we do encourage you, if you like this webinar, to um, it's going to be recorded, so it will be available on our Hamilton Fit um, YouTube channel page. So if you want to watch it again, you're always welcome to do that. We also have other webinars that we've done that are posted as well on our YouTube channel. And every month we're planning new ones. So we do encourage you to go to our group and workshop page um, at www.hamiltonfit.ca to see our upcoming webinars as well as our online groups that we now have available. And there's just some of the information. The online groups you do have to register for because you will receive a Zoom meeting invite to be part of the group. Um, so that is not a recorded um, session. That is where it's an interactive group versus the webinars. It's open for everybody and you don't need to register ahead to receive a Zoom invite. So we do encourage you, if you do have further questions about iron and B12, to reach out to your primary care team. Um, you can always book a phone appointment with your dietitian at your family doctor's office. All of us are offering virtual care now, and we're happy to talk with you. Uh, you can also email us at the Hamilton Family Health Team, and we're happy to answer your questions. And we've listed a few little websites there for you that also have some great sources of, of food information that you might enjoy. We wanted to get your feedback on this. We, uh, we have a little poll for you that only takes a few seconds that basically just to find out from you, how did you hear about these sessions? You know, is there something you've learned? You know, who's your family doctor? Again, just trying to get feedback from people attending to see what are they looking for and what else can we offer? So we'll give you a minute or two to do that. In addition, Hillary, I think we want to pull up the chat box because we have a whole series of questions I see we're flying through. And, and welcome to our physio team, our physio team's watching too, but there's quite a few questions um, that were posted. And let me just pull up the chat if I can get to it here. So first question for you, Hillary, has to do with the recommended daily intake for iron. Why is it lower in lactation than in non-pregnant females? That's a great question. I think part of it has to do with the stores of iron. Um, now, do you have further information about that? I'm not sure I actually know the answer to that. It's a, it's a great question. Yeah. Um, a lot of it has so, to do with the iron stores, right? Right. So keep in mind in pregnancy, you're building iron not just for the mom, but for the babe, right? And that third trimester needs are much, much higher because babe is going to be basically living off of those stores of iron for the first six months of life until they're introduced to iron rich foods. And so that's why it's a bit higher in pregnancy. Um, and when you're lactating, of course, you've already given birth to the little one. Um, and so your, your needs for iron are not as high because you're not sort of helping to stock up their iron supply. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have another question too. So a lot of people take Feramax, which is one of the supplements out there. Um, that has quite a bit of iron, right? So Feramax comes um, as 300 milligram pills if you're buying the pill version, but half of it, 150 milligrams, is the elemental iron you spoke about. Um, 
so we only use that if someone's actually iron deficient. Mm -hmm. So if someone is just a healthy female with regular menstruation in a day, you would only need 18 milligrams of iron of which many can get from their foods. If you can't get it from your foods for, for whatever reasons, different styles of eating or different foods, we can always look at a, a lower dose supplementation. So in that case, if you're not actually, if your blood works, you know, hemoglobin is normal, your ferritin is normal, it's above 40, for example, we wouldn't use a high dose iron supplement. We would just recommend either um, like a one a day multivitamin and mineral supplement for women that would have the day's worth, which is 18 milligrams of iron. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't need the higher dose unless you were actually deficient. Yeah. And the other thing I think it's important to know is that it is possible to get too much iron. Mm -hmm. um, something that's really important to know because it's one of the few um, vitamins that can actually be dangerous if you get too much of it, especially over long periods of time. And this is in particularly important around children. So we always recommend if anybody in the house has any iron supplements, even just multivitamins, um, they can be overdosed on, especially for kids. So we keep them up and away um, in locked yeah. cupboards. It's really important. So it is possible to get too much, especially if you've been on a really high dose for a really long time so and, and especially for men too right men don't have the month uh, a monthly menstrual loss as well as some people have a condition called hemochromatosis where iron levels are too high in their body and in that case absolutely we would not want them taking an iron supplement so again everyone's very different and we encourage you to connect um, with your doctor or your dietitian perhaps even more specifically just to to really look closer at some of the nutritional intake as well as your needs Mm -hmm. Then we have one other question. Is, is there a way to know or suspect if I have low iron or low B12 or just through labs? Mm -hmm. So again, that was our symptoms. We had a good discussion about some of these symptoms. Fatigue is always number one, mm -hmm. right? Heavy menstrual loss would be another big red flag to consider because it is tough to get 18 milligrams of iron a day for women with menstrual loss. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, Hillary and I were talking about some of our patients before and we have some young teens where it, they're really struggling with trying to get enough iron in um, with menstrual loss, right? So that, that is looking for those symptoms. Um, iron loss can lead to so many different symptoms, though. So it is, as a, as a female, I would advocate to speak to your doctor about um, getting um, some blood work done just to get your CBC and your ferritin done. I mean, that's something, you know, asking for that at least once a year is very prudent. It's not excessive in terms of costing the system. Um, and a very, really important one because it is so, so common, yet we know anemia affects concentration, mental health, physical health and fatigue, right? So it is something definitely to investigate. Mm -hmm. And I think too, uh, same goes for vitamin B12 because vitamin B12 is not as commonly thought of um, mm. Some physicians, you know, don't check it very often at all. So it's a good one, especially if you're a vegan um, and you're not eating any animal products, I definitely request your vitamin B12 status. Um, or if you're on any of those medications, if you have any acid disruption in the stomach, um, it's very difficult to absorb. So, um, you know, but some people are just low, like myself, for example, I'm not a vegan. I'm not on, you know, any of those medications and I'm still low if I don't supplement regularly. Yeah. So, you know, it's good for, for people just to ask if you haven't, if you haven't checked. Yeah, it is very common and, and, and something you can fix. And so a lot of older people, when they come to see me, sometimes they're worried about memory loss and we do their B12 levels and sometimes they're in the bucket, like they're like 110. And so that's definitely contributing to some of those cognitive changes that they're actually reporting. So it is very common, again, a very inexpensive test. Um, and again, we would test you again three months after supplementation to assess your response to see, do you need to continue with it or not? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, oh, thanks for all the info. And people were saying that they're taking some iron supplements. Yeah, there's so many iron supplements. So it can get very confusing and can get very costly. So I do encourage you to meet with uh, one of the dietitians or even ask us if you see us in the hallway because you know, not only will we save any, maybe perhaps any GI issues if you're, you have that tendency, but also some costs as well, because it can get expensive yeah. because it's not covered, right? It's not a script. So it's over the counter. Um, and that's something people have to pay out of pocket for usually. Mm -hmm. And we got another really good question. If, mm -hmm. if 
possible to stay on iron long term? And I would say yes, but probably not at those really high doses. Those are not good maintenance doses. Um, yes, some people do need to be on iron kind of indefinitely, especially if they're at really high risk of deficiency and every time they stop supplementing, they drop again. It's definitely possible, but I wouldn't say you know, something that's a really high dose should be taken every single day. Yeah. I mean, in, in some cases, it's possible, um, but uh, generally speaking, a, a lower dose. Yeah, is it's not usually long term, right? It's usually to correct the deficiency. One tip I would have is what you mentioned about, you know, trying to make sure there's vitamin C or fruit or veg at every meal definitely will enhance absorption. Don't take your iron pill with tea or coffee. Tea blocks 70% of iron absorption. So tea is a fabulous drink. You can have it any time of the day, but don't have it with your foods and don't have it with your iron supplement because it dramatically will impair um, how well you absorb. And we only absorb a fraction of that anyway, right? So, you know, you're looking at a maybe 20% of that we absorb. And if someone's vegetarian, we maybe absorb 10%. So the absorption rates do vary depending on the style of eating we have, but definitely tea and coffee I've found in particular, if we can separate that 30 minutes from a meal, works great to help enhance dairy, iron absorption. Right? Pardon? And, and dairy as well, right? Like calcium supplements and dairy. Yeah, so yeah. So yeah. high dose iron starts to interact with lots of things, right? So um, can calcium supplement can be one of them too. Mm -hmm. So lots of great questions. So thank you everybody. I think this is great. Mm -hmm. So thank you for joining us and uh, let us know if you want other content. We're happy to do more and, and thanks Hillary. This was great. Yes. Agreed. So have a good day everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>